Hello. Uh, thank you all for coming um, to Senator Spilka's wonderful senior fair, which has been, she's had been doing it, well, she's been here forever, it seems, so I feel like I've been doing these forever. Um, and annually, as part of that, I typically do this presentation, which is a kind of an update of Elder Law 101. Elder Law 101, so to give you some brief background, my name is Arthur Bergeron. I'm an attorney at Myrick O'Connell. Myrick O'Connell, uh, there were 60 of us at Myrick O'Connell, and as a result, so we're a multi-specialty firm. There are 40 in uh, Worcester and 20 in Westboro. But as a result of being in that kind of firm, I have the ability to just do what I really like doing, which is Elder Law. Um, my average client, or my median client age is 74. I love this work. People think I'm still young when I'm doing this, which is always fun. Um, and so, um, this presentation really isn't, I mean, we do a, I do a lot of presentations designed for very, very specific topics around mass health qualification and, and, and uh, around annuities and other stuff. But this is really to kind of tell you, I mean, kind of, it, everything you kind of need to know in general terms if you are, say, 65 or older, or if you are like them, if you're like my average clients. My typical clients are Frank and Mary, their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. If you've seen me before, you know that I always say, if, if you get that joke, you're old enough to be my clients. The young people, they kind of scra you know, they scratch their head when I say that. And so Frank and, uh, Frank and Mary have very um, straightforward goals. They're now retired. Um, they want to live in their house until they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. Um, in terms of their estate plan, if one of them dies, they want to leave everything to the other one. If the two of them have died, they want everything divided up among their kids. They want everything liquidated, that means turned into money and then divided up among their kids. If that sounds like a familiar plan, you know, you may have heard that basic kind of plan before. So the goal is, how do they get there and what do they need to be doing in order to get there and how do they not waste money on lawyers that they don't need to waste uh, but only spend money on lawyers that, that they need to in order to get to their plan. And, and this is their financial situation. They own a home. Um, they own it jointly. Um, it's worth about $300,000 now. It's been going up, fortunately. It had gone down for a while. Frank has an IRA worth $150,000. Um, they have an annuity. Frank's actually the owner of the annuity. Mary is named as the death beneficiary. It always amazes me when you have an annuity that the person that gets the checks every month is not called the beneficiary. It's actually called... That's the, that's the person who gets everything after the first person dies. So he has an annuity. They have a joint bank account worth $75,000. Uh, so their total assets are six twenty-five. dollars His income is from Social Security, $1,500 a month, pension $500. Her income is half of his. He gets, she gets the, the usual spousal Social Security check because she didn't work um, when she was younger. Otherwise, her Social Security check might very well be higher than that. Uh, um, so that's their basic situation, and their question is, so what do they really need? And, and in terms of, of, of planning documents, and I told you what their plan is, that, well, you know, everybody comes in saying they really, really think they need a will, because that's a crucial part of, of, of uh, getting older and stuff, and ha is having a will. And I tell them, I say, well, regarding your estate plan, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later on, you really don't. Because if you have no will and you die, and your assets go through the probate process, which is the process that is used for people who own particular assets when they die, then, and you have no will, then basically the state has written a will for you. And what the will says is, if you die and you have a spouse, everything goes to your spouse. And if you die and your spouse has died, everything goes to your kids. So really, you don't need a will in order to deal, to make sure the property gets distributed that way. But people will say, well, I, you know, I want a will so that I won't have to go through probate. Well, actually, that does not solve that problem. Having a will, does not mean you are avoiding probate. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more. But the documents that you do need to have, if you're Frank and Mary, you need to have these three documents. You have to have a healthcare proxy, you need a MOLST form, and you need a power of attorney. Now I bet you, just uh, everybody here knows two out of three of those terms. How many, raise your hand if you know what a MOLST form is. Nobody, okay. So a MOLST form is the, is the, the new, version of what was the do not resuscitate form, the, the so-called DNR form or comfort care form, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more. The reason why you need those is that these are all documents that affect you while you're still alive. After you have died, if you've got Frank and Mary's probate or, uh, or, or estate plan in mind, you really don't even need anything, right? But while you're alive, if you are disabled and you don't have a health care proxy, then, and someone needs to medic, make, make a medical decision for you, and the hospital insists that they're not gonna accept your spouse 
even though, because they're not supposed to. They're not supposed to. Your spouse does not have the legal right to make a medical decision for you, right? Nor do your kids, of course. But if, and, and, and typically hospitals have kind of let that go. But as the world is getting more litigious and doctors and hospitals are getting more nervous, I think that's going to continue, they're going to move, continue to move away from that. And they're going to expect you to have a healthcare proxy or to get someone named as your guardian um, to act on your behalf, which is a terribly cumbersome process. Power of attorney um, is the document that you need if you are disabled. Um, and if you want, you need someone to make your legal decisions for you as opposed to your health care decisions, all other decisions. Sign a check, sign a deed, talk to your insurance company, talk to the, talk to the nursing home, talk to anybody. So we're going to talk about those for a few minutes. So health care proxy, you need to have two witnesses. They can be anybody. The witnesses can be. Um, your proxy can be anybody except a person who works in a, a, a um, medical institution, a hospital or a nursing home. Um, if they work there, then they can only be your proxy if they're also related to you. But the witnesses can be anybody. The way the proxy works is very simple. If, you, if a doctor says in writing that you cannot make a medical decision, at that point your proxy can make them for you. The proxy's power is, is infinite. The proxy is acting on your behalf and can do anything that you could have done. If you've done a, a if, and by the way, in, if in your proxy you've put in any language that says, oh, I don't want to receive any extra, you know, special treatment, I don't want to be plugged into machines, blah, 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 your proxy can overrule all of that. None of the information that is in, the, none, no advanced directive that way, other than in a MOLST form, uh, is legally binding. So people think they can put these instructions ahead of time regarding how they're going to be cared for. They can't. That's, that's, it's not legally binding. Uh, and, it's right. and, and, if, and, if, and, you're, and, and if you have put it in, even in your most form, your, your proxy can always overrule it. So the key, you really want to talk to your proxy about how you're going to be treated if a doctor says you can't make your deci medical decisions because that proxy is going to make all decisions. Well, what about nursing homes? I don't want to sign a, a proxy, won't, can't, what if, I don't want my daughter to put me in a nursing home. I don't want to give her that proxy. Well, the, the, the good news is, uh, if you're the, my client, the older person, that um, if, if, you, if you're, you've named your daughter as your proxy and your daughter thinks you're really slipping and brings you to the nursing home and says, we, we want you to be admitted, and you say, oh, I don't want to be admitted, there's a case that says that in that case, what you've just done is you revoked your proxy. Um, and you can revoke your proxy even if it is determined that you're med medically incompetent because for purposes of revocation, um, you're always competent. That's what the statute says. So nobody can be forced to go to a nursing home if they don't want to, even if they've signed a proxy and the proxy says, we want, you know, we, we want you to go to the nursing home. And nursing homes, who once again, were more kind of flexible with that stuff, increasingly are taking that very seriously because they don't want to get into legal trouble, okay? Um, finally, you can, as I've suggested, revoke your proxy at any time, no matter what, your, what anybody else thinks is your um, medical uh, or competence, you can revoke your proxy at any time, okay? Uh, one other thing just about proxies is that your proxy also has total control over your remains after you die. Um, you think, or you probably thought, that in order to maybe an organ donor, you had to sign like a little card, it goes on your license or whatever. No, if you've got a proxy, it is presumed when you die that your organs can be donated to someone. Um, and the person who is in charge of your organs, even after you're dead, well, specifically after you're dead, is your proxy. If, if, your pro if there is no proxy, then it's your, your personal representative. It used to be called the executor under the estate. After that, it's the next of kin. Um, now, the MOLST form, M-O-L-S-T, Medical Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. Um, this is a form, the significance of this form, although there is a line in it that you, for you to assent to it, is that it's signed by the doctor. Not that it's signed by you, it's signed by the doctor. It is a medical order from the doctor. And what it's basically doing is it's telling the doctor, or excuse me, it is the doctor telling medical professionals who are farther down the food chain, like nurses and EMTs, what to, what to not do that they would normally do. Because these folks uh, have all got protocols um, as to what they're supposed to do. Only doctors can just kind of make any decision at all. Folks down the food chain are supposed to obey the protocols. Like, 
if, so if the EMT shows up at your house and you're on the floor and, you're, and your heart has stopped, they're supposed to try to make it start. They're supposed to try to make it start. Or if you stop breathing, they're supposed to try to make you breathe. And if you're in this kind of condition, they're not going to leave you at home. They're going to bring you to the hospital. That's what they're supposed to do. And at the hospital, they're going to do all of these other things, right? Unless there is a mole form in which you can say um, things like, don't resuscitate me. And we're going to talk about those in a few minutes. But the, the main thing about that form is that you want it on the refrigerator. You want it, you want to go to, if you want to find the form, go talk to your doctor. Doctors um, traditionally had not wanted to spend a lot of time on this because, to be fair, they weren't getting paid for it to talk to you by Medicare. But Medicare changed that rule as of this past January 1 and will actually now pay your doctor for a visit where you're talking about and going through the most form and talking about these decisions, okay? Now, the reason why you want to leave it on the refrigerator is that the EMTs, that's their protocol. When they walk in the house, if, you, if they think, if you're on the floor or someplace in the house and you know disabled, they are supposed to look on the refrigerator to see if there's a mold form. And if there isn't, that's the, they stop looking because they're busy because you're on the floor. They're busy, right? So if the mold form isn't on the refrigerator, forget it. It's, it's like useless, right? So you want it on the refrigerator. Finally, as I had mentioned earlier, your, your proxy can overrule anything you've said in the mold form. If you've said in your, in your mold form, do not resuscitate me, and you're at the hospital and your heart, heart stops, um, and, and, and your daughter there is there who has the, mold, the, the proxy and says, oh no, I want to resuscitate it, they're going to resuscitate you, right? She can overrule, she can make any health decision on your behalf, including overruling your previous decisions that you would put into the most form, okay? <laughs> yep. So a DNR that I have right now that doesn't have a doctor's signature on it is useless. Yeah, it doesn't do anything. If it's just a, a do not resuscitate or that you've signed and the doctor hasn't signed, it has no, it has no validity to it. Okay, um, so typical decisions that they're going to make that, that are on the most form that you're kind of checking off the box. Don't do this. Don't do that. One of them is don't give me CPR. Don't try to get my heart to start if it has stopped. Now, one of the and, and people you really want to think about that one. Um, one of the reasons is if you are over, I think the the ages, the data I got from a gerontologist was if you're <coughs> over 75, and your heart stops, and they're applying CPR. Your likelihood of living more than 30 days is 5%, right? Your likelihood of getting your heart to start again for a little while is like 25%. And the CPR process is incredibly, incredibly painful. They're pressing through your ribs and breaking most of them so that they can press down on your heart to try to make your heart start. So you want to think about that. Or intubation, putting a tube down your throat into your lungs to try to make you breathe again. Really uncomfortable. So, you want to think about those things. Talk to your doctor about it. My most, to me, the most important is the last one, though. Do not hospitalize. Frank and Mary want to die, live in their house until they die. They want to die at home. They don't want to die in a hospital. If you don't want to die in a hospital, then don't go to a hospital. You know, if something really bad has happened, then let yourself die. Because as opposed to the old days, remember when we were growing up, you know, when you'd always hear people had a heart attack and they died, or they had a stroke and they died because the system wasn't there to capture them and get them going again before. The, but that doesn't, now the EMT really shows up, you know, and they bring you in and, I mean, you might be really disabled. You're not gonna be the same, uh, but you're, they're gonna make you keep going, okay? So if you don't wanna be at the hospital, then say in the, in the most form, I don't wanna go to the hospital. Finally, um, and, they can leave you at home. and they can leave you at home. They have to leave you at home. If, you say, if the doctor has instructed them on the most form, do not hospitalize, they won't hospitalize unless your proxy has said, oh no, bring them out of the hospital. In which case, she overruled the moles form, okay? So that's how that works. So once again, the alternative to this, to the, to the, to the um, healthcare proxy is this guardianship process, which typically costs about $10,000 because it's, it's very, very procedurally complicated. It's really designed to keep people from getting appointed guardians who shouldn't. Uh, this process has become more complicated over time as a result of legislative efforts on behalf of you know, the disabled. Um, so it's a, just a pain. It's, 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 it typically it involves, family fights ensue, it's public, it costs a lot of money. You don't, okay, your, your, your power of attorney. Power of attorney, does it have to be witnessed to be valid? No. Does it have to be notarized? No. 
uh, unless the, the, the power of attorney is, unless you, you've given your, your attorney the power to sign um, documents that are going to be recorded in the registry of deeds, like deeds or mortgages or things, um, for those documents, if for those documents to be recorded on your behalf, the power of attorney, which is notarized, has to be recorded. All other powers of attorney don't need to be notarized or witnessed. Do you want to have them notarized? Um, yes. Witness, if it, it, you know, if you have somebody available, great. But always have them notarized. Why is that? Um, it, um, because the people who are deciding whether the power of attorney is valid are not lawyers or doctors. They're kind of random folks, right? My, my, you, those of you who have heard me have heard me say, uh, my, my daughter, who is my oldest daughter, who is now a lawyer, a big time Wilmer Hale lawyer in DC, when she was little, or little, when she was in high school, gave me a t shirt once for my birthday. It said, the good lawyer knows the law, the great lawyer knows the judge, right? <laughs> now, in the case of a power of attorney, the judge isn't a real judge, it's the guy at the bank, the teller, you know, because your son is going to the, the and wants to sign one of your checks or it's the, the person you're calling from the insurance agency or whatever, right? So, so those people don't know that you don't need a notarization or, a, or a witnesses, right? And so you want a document that looks really valid. Those people also don't know, by the way, that powers of attorney last forever. That's why I always tell people you want a power of attorney that's like less than five years old because otherwise people start questioning it. It looks really old. Oh, I don't know if this is valid. So you're doing all these things just to make it look good. Right? And that sounds stupid, but that's why you're doing it. Um, in your power of attorney, though, you always want to put in, if you're willing to do this, that your attorney has the ability to make gifts for you and to self-deal, to make gifts to himself or herself. One of the reasons that's so important is for mass health planning purposes, and I'm going to talk about that in a little while. But, but, and the reason why I mention this is that oftentimes powers of attorney are done by, or, or in the past, powers of attorney have been done by people who are primarily focused on tax-related issues. And so often there'll be a provision that says no gifts can be made exceeding the annual federal tax number, which this year is like $14,000 for gifts. And if that's in there and you're trying to do asset restructuring for mass health purposes, you've got a big problem because you can't do what you need to do. Um, finally, whereas the, the healthcare proxy, you can only name one person at a time. I name my, you know, my husband first, and then my daughter, and then my son, but only one person at a time, because doctors don't want to have to talk to two people about how to treat you. They only want to talk to one. Um, your, health, your power of attorney, though, you can name more than one person at the same time. You can name them jointly, if you don't trust them, and you want to make sure everybody has to sign. Um, or you can make them jointly and severally, which is the most common. You can name two people, or three, jointly and severally, which means any one of them can act at any time on your behalf. So that if you've named two of your kids and one of them's out of town or traveling, then the other one can take care of things. Okay, um, the, the alternative to the, to the power of attorney is the conservatorship process, separate from the guardianship process, right? So if you're disabled and you need someone to make your medical decisions and your legal decisions, you have to do this $10,000 twice. You have to go through two separate processes now. It used to be they were combined. So you want to avoid all of that, and it's easy just with the power of attorney. Um, now I'm going to talk to pro about probate for a few minutes. So the purpose of the probate process is to figure out who is going to own the things that you own when you die. Um, and so if you're, uh, if you're it, so it only affects assets that are in individual names. If you own an asset jointly with someone, like oftentimes husbands and wives will own things jointly, the legal consequence of that is that each of you owns 100% of whatever that is, whether it's your house or your bank account or whatever. So if one of you dies, that person's interest simply evaporates, leaving the other person as the sole owner. So those assets never go through probate, right? Um, so, so in this case, um, so Frank and Mary own their house jointly, they have those joint bank accounts. Frank has an IRA. That IRA also would not go through probate. Um, the reason it is because if Frank died. The reason is because it looks like Frank is the owner of that asset, but it re he really isn't. When he gets his statement from the bank or from Fidelity or whatever every month, it's, it says at the top, it says custodian for, Fidelity custodian for. The, the, technically, Fidelity owns that money, or the bank does, but they're kind of taking care of it for Frank, and he has the right to get it by asking for it, and, and then they'll, but then they're going to report that to the government, et cetera. So when he dies, 
The way he figures out where that money is going to go is by naming a death beneficiary. There's a death beneficiary form that he can sign. Similarly with annuities, annuities, uh, all of the annuities I've ever seen um, have a provision whereby you can simply name who's going to get that asset after you die, right? So that's the death beneficiary. Um, so, so if Frank were to die, um, then there would be no need for a probate because the joint accounts would simply become owned by Mary. The IRA, presumably, she, he's named Mary as the death beneficiary and presumably he's done the same thing on the annuity. If Mary dies, though, then there would be a need for probate if her assets are still in her name, okay? So the question then would be, regarding go, there, go, first of all, regarding that probate process, where does she want to leave all of these things, right? Does she want to leave them simply to her three kids? In which case she really, and is she okay with it going through probate? In which case she really doesn't need a will. Um, the times when she may want to think about a will would be if she's got a child who either has a creditor problem or a family problem or a disability problem. And then we're going to talk about the house separately. Because if she's got, if, if Peter Paul or Mary Jr are in bad shape financially, right? And they've got tax liens or there are creditors chasing them. By giving them something, you're really just giving it to the creditors because once you've given it to them, the creditors are all going to grab it. Um, if she's in a bad marriage situation, and, or he is, and so you're expecting a divorce, well, you really don't want to leave your assets to the daughter-in-law you never liked in the first place, you know, or the son-in-law, right? So, so you just assume uh, avoid that. Or if your child has a disability, you don't want to inadvertently cause that child to be disqualified for government benefits like Mass Health because he just inherited a bunch of money. So in all of those cases, what you, Mary could do through her will is she could say, well, instead of that money going directly to my child, I want, to go, I want it to go in trust for the benefit of my child. And I'm going to name a trustee, a legal, a person in legal control of that money for the benefit of my child. Oftentimes, she would, in that case, name one of her other kids uh, as the person for the benefit of, of, um, of the child that she's trying to protect. As long as the child that she's trying to protect does not have the legal right to get that money, then creditors can't go after it, the survive, the other sp that, that spouse you don't like can't go after it, and it doesn't disqualify, it isn't countable, and it doesn't disqualify them for government benefit programs. Finally, the house. Um, Mary may not want to le simply leave the house to the kids, right? Because when she says she wants to do that, that's not what she really means typically. It typically means she wants the house to get sold so that the money can get divided among the kids. Unless, of course, one of the kids is living there, in which case she may want to do a will anyway so that she can explain how that's going to work, right? But the problem if you leave the house to the kids is that now the three kids own the house. And so if anything needs to happen regarding that house, everybody has to agree, right? It's not majority rule. Everybody gets a veto because they all own the house. So if one of them is living in the house and doesn't want to leave and the others want to get it sold, well, now what do you do? Well, the only way you, thing you can do is you can go to court. You can file a petition to partition real estate, have a court order the sale of the house and the distribution of the proceeds after you've spent a couple of years and 20 or 30 or 40 thousand dollars in legal fees when you add up all of the legal fees, right? So, it, to the extent that you want to deal with that, you want to do it by basically specifying in the will that the house is going to get sold and the proceeds are going to get distributed. Or if there is some special thing that you're going to do, if you're going to, if once somebody is living in the house and you want them to stay in the house, um, well, don't just say they can stay in the house. I mean, that isn't really what you mean. You mean they can stay in the house as long as they pay the bills, right? As long as they pay the taxes and the insurance and all that other stuff. And then the question is, well, if they don't pay those bills, well, then what happens? And so you want, to, you want the rules for that kind of set out ahead of time, just so that you can, you don't want your death to be the cause of fighting among your kids. Just, you want to avoid that. So what if you don't want to go through that probate process, though? Because the problem with probate is that uh, it takes a lot of time. I want to see if I've checked this. No, if, it takes a lot of time. Um, and it costs money, right? Uh, it takes time because uh, assets that are going through the probate process uh, are stuck in probate for a year. And the reason for that is because your creditors have the right to sue the estate for a year to get paid. 
And so the assets can't finally get distributed to the beneficiaries until that year has gone by. And the, now the reason for that, so, so for example, suppose, suppose I got into a car accident and I ran you over today. You would, under the law, you would have three years from today to sue me for damages if I hurt you as a result of running over you. If, on the, if though, I ran over you and then I hit that stone wall that was right next to me and died, you would only have one year to sue my estate to get paid, to get reimbursed. Now, so from your perspective, that's a short statute of limitations. You have a, very sh you have a shorter time than you would have had in order to get paid. But of course, from the perspective of the, of the kids, that's a really long statute of limitations. It means everybody's got to wait for a year before things can get distributed to see if a creditor shows up, right? So that's problem number one with probate. It always takes a, at least a year, not because the lawyers are lazy, but because the creditors have a year to sue. Second thing is, typically, you're gonna hire a lawyer to go through the probate process, to file all the forms that need to be filed to get you through that process. And that's gonna cost you, not a huge amount, five or $10,000, but it's not nothing, it's not nothing. And so you'd like to avoid it if you could. So how can you avoid it? Well, if you're Mary, remember we're assuming now that Frank's dead, right? If you're Mary, you could put your remaining assets in joint names. You could, regarding the IRA, you could name your kids as beneficiaries. Regarding the annuity, you could name your kids as beneficiaries. Then regarding your bank accounts and your house, you could put those assets in joint names with your kids. Because as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, if you own something jointly with your kids, the legal consequence of that is that you all own 100% of the asset. So if one of you dies, that interest evaporates and everybody else owns all of the asset. Now, the bad, that's the good news. The bad news is that if that, that being the case, any person that's jointly with you on your bank account can go take all the money, and any creditor of theirs can sue and attach all the money because it's their, it's their, because it's their money. It's 100%, it's 100 yours, but it's 100% theirs too. So that may be problematic. And then if you've got all these people with you on the house, so now instead of getting the three kids to agree on what to do with the house, you got four people, right? Now you wanna sell the house, what do you do? Well, everybody's gotta sign the deed. Or you wanna get a reverse mortgage, what do you do? Everybody's gotta sign the mortgage. So th there are issues with that, but it's the least expensive way to deal with avoiding probate. Second, regarding the house, is this option of a life estate. I bet you've all heard of that term, life estate, um, that, you, that you transfer your house, you keep a life estate in the house. That is total ownership until the moment of your death. But through a deed, you transfer the remaining interest, called the remainder interest, um, to somebody else, like your kids or to a trust, typically often to your kids. That's the simplest way to do this. So you can do that, and then the reason why people have often heard of this is this is a very common and the least, once again, the least expensive uh, house protection mechanism if you've got mass health concerns. If you want to make sure that house isn't going to get counted for mass health purposes if you need to qualify for mass health because you're in a nursing home. Five years after you've done that transfer to the, of the remainder interest to the kids, the remainder interest is no longer countable. Um, and you're still in the house, you have your life estate, if you go to a nursing home, Mass Health will put a lien on that life estate um, to make sure they get repaid, except as long as you um, don't sell the house while you're alive, when you die, your interest evaporates. Your life estate evaporates, and therefore so does the lien. And now your kids have the house lien free. So some people will do this. I'm just going to give you two problems with this. Because all of these are decisions. The purpose of a lawyer is not to tell you what to do. The purpose of a lawyer is to tell you what your options are, to tell you what your legal options are and kind of help you figure out what the risks are and you decide what to do. So you decide whether this is an issue. So I'll give you two life estate concerns. Um, both came out of, interestingly, families in Martha's Vineyard. I do a lot of work in Martha's Vineyard where, in, where as opposed to your stereotype of Martha's Vineyard, oh, there's a lot of, people have a lot of money down there. Actually, the money flies in in June and flies out in September. People in Martha's Vineyard are pretty average folks, you know, the people that work, you know, my, my paralegal, whose son is ta taping this right now, she grew up there, her dad worked on the boat, worked on the ferry that you get across to Martha's Vineyard. And then there are people that work and run the restaurants and all that stuff. So anyway, I got a call from one lady who had um, transferred her house, a remainder interest to her son more than five years ago, kept a life estate. She's now 80 years old. Um, she's passed the five years, so she knows for mass health purposes the house is safe. 
But she said, I just want to check. My son just got served with divorce papers by his wife. And so is this going to be a problem? I said, oh yeah, that's a problem. I said, because he owns the remainder interest in the house. And so you, there's a, there are actually tables um, that, through which you can calculate in terms of a house value, what percentage of the value is attributable to the life estate and what percentage to the remainder interest. And if you give someone a remainder interest and you're only two years old, well, the remainder interest has pretty much um, got very little value and your life estate has got all the value. If you give somebody your remainder interest and you're 100 years old, your remainder value has got a very small value because your life estate, your life expectancy is really short. So by the time you're like 80, uh, that breaks down to be about 20%, 80%. 80% to the remainder, 20% to the life estate. Uh, and in this case, the house is in Vineyard Haven, worth about $800,000, so that the, the, the um, life estate uh, was worth, um, or the, let's see, it's two, four, six, eight, yeah, $800,000. So the, the life estate was worth about $200,000 and the remainder about six. So that $600,000 in value was gonna be in play in that divorce, right? Now that's a problem. Second example, a couple that had bought a house in Oak Bluffs. Oak Bluffs is an interesting community, uh, has a fairly large Afro-American population. Oh, it has since the turn of the 20th, or the turn of the, the 20th century. Um, historically, because a lot of musicians from, uh, or entertainers from New York City would vacation there. And so it became a place, it became a kind of a very, you know, kind of a safe and, and welcoming place for a lot of Afro-Americans during the ages when they weren't welcome in a lot of places. So Oak Bluff still has a very large Afro-American population, so does Martha's Vineyard. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's one of the reasons why Obama would always go to Martha's Vineyard, as vacation, as a matter of fact. Um, so anyway, there was a couple that had had a, that were from um, Roxbury, and they had bought a house in Oak Bluffs, wonderful little house, two blocks from the beach, beautiful, um, many years ago, and then they, they, they transferred the house to their kids but kept a life estate. They transferred the house to the three kids and kept a life estate. Uh, and so now they're 80 or 81, between, in their early 80s, um, but, and they're both very healthy, right? And so now what they really want to do is they want to sell the house and go back to um, Boston because a lot of their grandchildren are around there. Um, and it's going to be cheaper for them than trying to live on Martha's Vineyard where the food is expensive. You know, of course, everything has to get imported. Um, so they told their kids they need the kids to transfer their interest back to the parents so that the parents can sell the house. And two of them will, but one won't. And so they said, well, what do we do? And I said, well, there's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do. That child owns that interest and is not obligated in any way to sell, transfer it back to you. Well, what can we do? Nothing, you can't sell your house. If I'm gonna buy your house, I don't wanna buy your life estate and two thirds of the rest. I wanna buy the whole house, right? So they've got a problem. They said, well, well you know, can we get a reverse mortgage? Because that was one of their issues. Is that, you know, they, they get, their income is okay, but their savings aren't great. I said, sure, as long as everybody will sign on the reverse mortgage, because if I'm the bank, I don't want a mortgage on two-thirds of the house plus the life estate, I want a mortgage on the whole thing. So they're stuck. So there are cases in which the life estate is not a, a great idea. Um, um, so those are just kind of, the, the, it, fi finally, um, you don't need to worry in, if you're trying to avoid probate, if you only have, if you've dealt with all this other stuff, but you only have stuff in the house. Right? People will say, well, don't I need to, you know, to specify who's going to get what you know, in my will or in something? And the answer is, well, yeah, legally, if anybody were arguing. But typically, nobody argues about that stuff. Right? So if you've, if you've dealt with all the other issues, um, you may want to just do a letter to your kids that says, here's how I want the stuff divided, or here, or here are the, the people that I want to get the thing. If you're really nervous about it, uh, especially if you, or if you have no kids and, and you want it to be clear, you're giving things to your best friend, you can give them a deed to, the, to that property. You can actually deed them that stuff. Deeds, it is thought, only refer to real estate. That's actually not true. Deeds refer to any transfers of property. It's called a chattel deed or a bill of sale. You can actually give them a bill of sale. So you can, avo you can avoid probate. Um, Another way to do it is through, and you may have heard of this, is by putting your property into trust. The most common, uh, um, not the most common, a common way for Mary to handle avoiding probate, if she wanted to do so regarding the two assets that she's concerned about, her house and her bank accounts, 
is she would create a revocable and amendable trust. She would name herself revocable because she could always take the property out of trust if she wants to. And amendable because she can always change the rules regarding who gets what uh, at any time. And she would name herself as the trustee. She'd name one of her kids as the successor trustee. And then she'd deed her house into that trust to herself as the trustee. And she'd put her larger bank accounts, like her CDs and stuff, in trust to her as the trustee. And that way, upon her death, the trust would become irrevocable. That is, she couldn't because she could no longer take the property back because she'd be dead. Um, but also unamendable, so that the, the successor trustee would have to abide by the rules in the trust. And the, typically that trust would say that the successor trustee will liquidate everything and divide it among the kids. Remember, that's the estate plan, right? Now that trust, for tax purposes, has absolutely no effect on Mary. It's a so-called grantor taxable trust. So as far as the IRS and the State Department of Revenue are concerned, it's as if the trust doesn't exist. So if she then turns around and sells the house, which she can because she's the sole trustee of the trust. She doesn't need the kid's assent or anything. And she gets paid for it, and she's got a big capital gain on that house because she bought it for very little and now she's selling it for a lot, which is not uncommon. She can still use her capital gains exemption, her $250,000 capital gains exemption, because for tax purposes, it's still hers. Similarly, for mass health purposes, it's still hers. It's still hers. So that if she then needs nursing home care, as far as Mass Health is concerned, she, she still owns that house. Uh, as a matter of fact, if she wants to protect it by saying that she intends to return to her home after she gets out of the nursing home, she's going to need to deed her house back to herself individually. But it's going to be, it's going to be, um, um, it's going to, it's either going to have to be sold if it stays in trust, or if it gets deeded back to her and she says she's going to return home, then she won't have to sell it, but Mass Health will put a lien on that house and that will survive her death because she's going to be the sole owner of the property, okay? Finally, finally, um, if you are Frank and Mary, then your biggest worry really is about mass health and about nursing home care because you know if you own your own home and your income is okay and you've got a little bit of savings, you're not going to outlive your money. You're going to be able to be okay until you die. Unless you have to spend a lot of time in a nursing home, that's the one bill that you kind of hadn't anticipated and that isn't gonna get covered by Medicare. Medicare only covers nursing home costs if, if well, I always use the term, they cover the cost of getting better, not the cost of staying the same. So Medicare will only cover your nursing home bill if you've been in a hospital admitted for three days. That proves that you were sick and therefore you're there to get better. And even at that, they'll only cover 100 days in the nursing home. After 100 days, they figure you're not getting better. And so Medicare stops, which means you're on private pay unless you qualify for mass health. So, Every senior needs to know MassHealth 101. Once again, they're Frank and Mary's basic assets. They got their house, he's got an IRA, she's got an annuity, they got the bank accounts. If Mary needs nursing home care today because she just had a stroke and went in and went to the hospital for three days and now Frank talks to me, I'm gonna tell him that Mary can qualify for MassHealth immediately. Immediately. Well, not immediately, it's gonna take a couple days. The reason for that is that, the, that while Mary, while the two of them are alive, while Mary cannot have more than $2,000 in countable assets, Frank can own the house as long as the equity in the house is less than $828,000, can have other cash or cash equivalent assets, which means things that you can turn into cash, like the IRA or the annuity, of up to $119,220 and can have unlimited income. So if Mary's in the nursing home, all she has to do, uh, and by the way, somebody has to do it for her because of course now she's in the nursing home. So hopefully she signed a power of attorney naming Frank to act on her behalf and not limiting his ability to do this because he's about to move a lot of assets to himself, right? So on Mary's behalf, Frank is going to move the house to himself individually. Uh, gonna, she's gonna, he's going to transfer everything else to himself individually and then if his assets are more than that amount, $119,220, He's going to take that extra money and buy an annuity. Now, people will always say, I hate annuities. Some people love annuities. Some people have heard that they're terrible. They hate them. I hate annuities. They're a terrible investment. Frank is not doing this as an investment. He's not doing this to improve his earnings on this money from 1% to 5%. He's doing it to qualify Mary for mass health 
so that he can keep from having to pay the nursing home bill of $12,000 every month, right? So, and I'm gonna take all questions at the end. Um, so the day after, so as long as Frank buys an annuity with his extra money, the money that's over that number, and as long as that annuity calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than Frank's life expectancy, Frank's actuarial life expectancy, if Frank were 85 or 89, for example, his life expectancy would be five years. Um, the day after he buys, he, that, that purchase of an annuity is a legitimate conversion from a countable asset to a non-countable income stream. And Frank can have unlimited income. So the day after Frank buys the annuity, Mary qualifies for MassHealth, okay? Um, the question then for Frank is, it, suppose Mary hasn't gone to a nursing home, but Frank wants to make sure that Mary's gonna be safe if Frank dies. Because if Frank dies, given the current estate plan, which is that Mary inherits everything, right? Now there's gonna be a problem because Mary's gonna have way too much in assets, right? Mary's gonna have to spend on all that money till she gets down to her, just her house. She won't have to sell her house, but, but MassHealth will put a lien on that house to make sure that MassHealth gets repaid after her death. The way that Frank can protect Mary is he can't avoid probate and at the same time protect Mary. But what he would do is he would change his will to say that upon his death, everything that was going to go to Mary will instead be, pulled, be put in trust for Mary's benefit. He can name one or more of his kids as, the, uh, as the, um, uh, the trustees for Mary's benefit. If he does that, puts all his assets into his name, um, and by the way, they don't have to be put into his name immediately, just before he dies. It can literally be done the day before he dies. Then upon his death, all those assets are gonna be safe. They're gonna be in trust for Mary's benefit. Um, the trustees are gonna have the ability to use that money in any way they want to supplement Mary's care, right? So that if she's not in a nursing home, to pay any of her bills. Uh, or they can just write a check to Mary. If Mary says, oh my God, you know, I don't wanna have no money in the bank, I want $100,000, the trustee can give Mary $100,000. Now, if Mary then needs to qualify for MassHealth, that $100,000 is gonna to have to get spent down, but everything in trust is gonna be safe. So. By having that, by doing that will, making sure that there are powers of attorney, we've talked about that, and if Frank wants, shifting assets to himself, he can assure that if he dies, Mary's going to be safe. Now, he may say to himself, he and Mary may say, well, we don't know, one of us may die, we don't know which one dies first. Well, in that case, you may want, they may want to hold their assets just the way they are, change their will so that they know that at the last minute, if they need to, they can shift the assets to the person that they believe is going to die first. Or if they just, you know, they, they can also have the option of splitting their assets. They could keep one, you know, half of their assets in one person's name and half in the other person's name. That way they would know if somebody literally just dropped dead, at least half the assets would be safe. So that's, that's the plan that Frank would typically want to use, um, Frank and Mary, to make sure that if the first person died, the other person's gonna be safe. Now what about if Frank is dead, and we've just got Mary, and Mary is not needing nursing home care right now, but she's saying, oh, I really wanna get some, I wanna to try to protect my assets. I find, this is a very common situation, that people will come into me often with one of more of their kids, their spouse just died, and now they're worried about protecting their assets. And I tell them, I say, well, you know, now your options are more limited. Um, once again, those were the assets that they had, we could protect everything while the two of them were alive. If it's just Mary, though, that has all of those assets, then her only option is, if she wants to protect any of them, she has to give them away and wait five years. She can just give them away to the kids. Remember, we talked about giving away the house and retaining a life estate. We, regarding her money, she could just give that to the kids. An alternative to that, if she was worried about some of the things that we had talked about, is that she would create an irrevocable trust. Um, I'm not crazy about these, but this is how it works. Uh, and this is all, in, I, I was, I, when I originally designed this PowerPoint, I said avoid irrevocable trusts because um, these, case, these irrevocable trusts were being challenged in superior court, but a lot of that has been cleared up as a result of a recent appeals court decision. So, the way the trust would work is you would name, Mary would name one or more of her kids as the trustees of the trust, and she would transfer it to the trust. Um, the rema remainder interest in her house, she'd keep a life estate, um, and also any cash that she wanted to protect. 
and the terms of the trust would be the trustees would have the, the right at any time uh, to dis during Mary's lifetime to distribute any of those assets to themselves but not to Mary so Mary's not a beneficiary so we're not worried that this trust is going to get challenged by mass health um, if during her lifetime Mary says geez I really need some of that money that I've transferred into the trust then the trustees could transfer it to themselves and then turn around and give it back to Mary now I know that sounds like a scam and so you say to yourself does MassHealth would they really allow this and the answer is yes MassHealth had been challenging those um, and there were some superior court judges that had upheld those challenges but there was a recent appeals court case that determined that these trusts are legitimate that just happened like June or July of this year um, so Mary's concern about all of this is well but what if the kids don't give me back the money totally legitimate concern nothing I can do about that that's why they call them trusts that's why they call them trusts. you have to trust the trustee so if Mary can't trust anybody to give the money back to her then there is no way that she can protect any of these assets as far as um, mass health is concerned except kind of the house if she keeps a life estate in the house so that she keeps the ability to live there, the ability to assure that no one can throw her out, right? Um, but then transfers the remainder interest to the trustees of this irrevocable trust. Then as far as the house is concerned, she hasn't lost a lot. She's lost the ability to sell the house. She's lost the ability to mortgage the house, right? Without the consent of the trustees, right? But she hasn't lost the ability to live in the house, which is the point of the house, okay? So those are Mary's options. Um, Mary's asset protection plan, if she does this, can also cause her to avoid probate. If she's taken the cash and the house and put them into this trust, then upon her death, she's not going to be the owner of those assets. And therefore, those assets are not going to go through probate. So that plan, in Mary's case, actually avoids probate. Uh, I'm not going to do those. Those are boring. Um, so if you... Uh, Enjoy this presentation, but I talk too fast and you want to hear it again. Mary, Frank and Mary have their own YouTube channel, Elder Law Frank and Mary. You can go see them anytime uh, or any of the sh other shows that I did. And remember, whenever you're doing this, the goal of all of the work that I do is to help people sleep at night. Um, you know, you get to a certain age, like our age, and like fame and fortune is no longer the issue. The question is, can you sleep, right? <laughs> right? So, so if this has helped you to, to do that, then, then um, I'm, I hope that it was worthwhile. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.